All right, we're going to be talking about risk mitigation. But first, I'm going to tell you a couple short stories. So back in my day in my agency life, I was working on migrating a site between two different hosts. Um, and part of the reason I was migrating, the one host, they didn't have any kind of um, other environments, like a, a test environment or something like that. So there was just the one environment. So I'm like, okay, let's get this moved over. I go in there, and to this day, I don't know what button I clicked. <laughs> there was obviously some user error here, but I clicked something and a pop-up, but I don't read pop-ups because they're annoying, and I apparently said yes. I was trying to look at the information about the DNS for the site, but apparently I said, irrevocably delete this website. And the entire site suddenly was just gone. Thankfully, I had grabbed a backup from before, and so instead of being able to like have a process of migrating the site, setting it up where I was going to, and then switching some DNS to make it live, I panic. I've got to get a site up. It's just gone off the internet. So I start immediately moving things, setting it up in the new environment. It takes me about three hours to get this finally situated. I am sweating the whole time, not sure if I could fully recover it, but I get there. I switch everything over and I write up this apology email, which I send the next morning. I send it over to them and they say, oh, thanks for letting us know. We didn't notice. I was terrified <laughs> out of my mind and they didn't even notice. Now, I contrast that to my time working at a university. Um, was working there and we needed to deploy a very simple change that had come out the core uh, to about 50 sites. Very small change. Now, unfortunately, our normal sysadmin who handles the rollouts of the code changes, he was on vacation, but he had trained this new person. They were ready to go. They began pushing out this change, and the first site, he, he roll, begins rolling it out. I go to take a look and see if these changes are working, and the site just throws a 404. The whole site is down. Uh, or, sorry, what is it? 503. The server, server had crashed. The site was gone. And I said, we got to start rolling this back. We can't do this. I don't know what happened. We'll just wait till they get back from vacation. I don't care if it's a security hotfix. It's breaking everything. But the scripts had started. So it takes 10 more minutes for it to finish. Then they can start the rollback. And then they begin to restore it. Of course, within five minutes of those sites being down, we start getting emails from people across campus. My site's gone. What's going on? So three hours, site completely lost. Nobody even noticed when you're working on a very small site. But when you start working at scale, all of a sudden, there's a lot more people looking at it. The impact of even a small problem in this case, I mean, it wasn't a small problem, but in this case, those sites were suddenly down for about 15 minutes as, as the scripts rolled in between. Um, but people began to notice right away because there was so many of these sites and they were being actively used. Uh, so I wanna talk about this because the ways that you work when you first start out in development, or at least when I first started out in development, they had to change as I began to work on sites at scale because they didn't scale up anymore. Now, before we jump into this, my name is John Richards. Um, I lead the developer advocacy team over at Pantheon. And the most important fact you should know about me is I have four cats. I love cats. If you've got pictures of cats, I always want to see pictures of cats. All right, so come up and show me your pictures of cats later on if you have them. Dogs are okay, I do like them, um, but not as much as cats. All right. So, uh, what are we gonna cover today? So I'm gonna be talking about deploying code at scale. Um, and so I wanna, what does that mean? What are we talking about here? Um, so when I think about this, in my mind, what I'm talking, yes, <laughs> thank you. I have already had a volunteer showing cat pictures here in the front row, thank you so much. Uh, so, what does it mean to deploy sites at scale? Uh, in my mind, when I think of this, because you know, people who work at an agency may very well be working on lots of different sites. Um, and there is going to be some similarities there. Um, but in my mind, when I start thinking of um, what we'll be talking about today, is when those things start to say, share a substantial portion of their code base. How much is substantial? That's up to you to decide. If it's one single, third party module, that's probably not the same thing, but if you've got a custom module or you're sharing code across multiple sites, um, then you, in my mind, that's what I'm thinking about here, what I'm talking about, and how, what we'll be looking at at mitigating risks for. So, got a couple questions for all of you out there to understand the room a bit. 
um, is anybody out there looking to begin scaling? Because a lot of people may already be there, but if you're looking to, you may have different things. All right, so it sounds like, how about people out there managing at least five sites? That's what I think of as where you suddenly start hitting that point. Um, who out there is managing five sites or so at least um, that share code across in some way? All right, we got a few people nodding, a couple people out there. So um, if you're in that environment, I have some news to share with you. Um, you have inherited a fairly thankless job of risk management. It, it's partly because you'll find out like teams don't have the resources to have somebody dedicated to risk management, so it's going to fall into you. Now, the goal of this is hopefully that you'll become more prepared and be able to maybe sleep a little better and not worry so much about the unknowns that are sitting out there. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about risk management. I do want to say my caveat up front. Um, there is a whole practice, professional practice around risk management. And that's not what this uh, talk is going to be about. We'll be using principles from that, um, but they have a whole special language that talks about opportunities and threats and um, how you do all of this. Um, we're going to simplify that down a little bit and talk about risk management and kind of three key pieces. One is um, this first step of assessing the situation. Um, after that, you want to identify what the risks that you're going to face are, um, and then you're going to look to try and mitigate those risks. So that will lead us, um, we'll be stepping into that and looking at that from a, a few different ways. So let's jump into those five tips that I kind of want to share here. So tip number one um, is the importance of establishing context. This is really that um, assessment phase. Um, you're trying to understand what's going on right here. Um, and, and this is going to be critical because every situation is a little bit different. I talked to lots of different groups that are trying to scale up, trying to figure out their workflows, and everybody's situation ends up being a little bit different. There are a lot of commonalities, so you can learn, you can use best practices, but your situation, the needs that you have, tend to be very different from other places. So, uh, things you're going to want to be thinking about. How is the code managed? When we're talking about Drupal, um, there's a lot of ways people do this. One of the ways you might think about as you're considering this, um, are you looking for start states? So if you're going to be uh, deploying at scale, you can say, hey, we're going to have a similar start state that we're going to have all of our sites use. But once that site begins to be built, it's going to change, become its own thing. We're not going to worry about needing to change things on that site that it needs to stay in sync with um, the original code. Um, so that's one way to do this. Oh, one second. There, I forgot about yeah. my uh, mask on. Okay, hopefully you can hear me a little better and I'm a little less muffled. Thank you. All right, uh, so you can think about it as like a nice start state that you can use for a lot of your different sites. Now, the other way to think about this is almost as a distribution model. And in this case, you're saying, hey, not only do I want this code to be shared across a lot of sites, but as they go down the line, I want updates to that original code to also update all the sites that are based off of it. And you're going to come up with very different models of how you approach this challenge um, based on which one of those you want to go down. Uh, and you might think about, do I, as I want to keep these things in sync, how much do they need to be kept in sync? Um, now, as everybody's moving towards D9, uh, you're using Composer. Uh, Composer can actually do a whole lot of this for you. If you're willing to use um, packages and create your own custom themes or modules inside of there, you can actually, without a whole lot of extra work, be able to deploy those across and keep them in sync across a lot of different sites um, using that model. Um, another model is using uh, a Git upstream where you have a central repository and you're going to have these downstream sites that are going to inherit that Git information that you can pull from and deploy that out across all your different sites. Um, and so you're going to be thinking about those often if you're thinking about that distribution model and how you keep those sites in sync. The other big question that always comes up inside of, uh, th that I hear when people are talking about Drupal and like, how do we handle configuration? Um, I've heard of lots of different ways that people are tackling this, um, but really when I talk about establishing the context, it's not that one of these is the right way. It's about understanding what your needs are, what, what your constituents or users, whatever you call your partners that you're going to be working with who will be handling those downstream sites, what their needs are. 
So some people use a, a model with like configuration split. So you've got your configuration, you're gonna ploy down, but you're trying to make that work horizontally instead of uh, vertically as you, as you use configuration split. So there's some challenges there. Um, some people just say, we're gonna force share our configuration across to everyone. Like we don't let our sites have unique ones. Um, another way to tap, so in that case, like if you've got a more um, centralized uh, architecture for your for your company um, that may make a lot more sense because you're like hey we can control this and we can say no you can't make changes so of course we'll use this model but of course if somebody comes along and says no you've got to make a change all of a sudden that can throw your whole model uh, so knowing that environment is really critical um, some people embrace using hooks so you can deploy your changes and then you might use PHP hooks to to run the configuration changes that you need to go along with that. Um, can be a little extra work to make sure that happens, um, but that's a model that tends to scale a little better. So if you know you're gonna get really large and need to handle this, um, there's some opportunity in there to, to save some time down the road. The other thing I wanna talk about is, depending on how you got into an environment, um, Sometimes you inherit these things, um, or uh, maybe it's just outgrown where it began. Uh, and in that case, sometimes you have to just scavenge what you can and leave the rest. So don't be afraid to do that. Now, I, I put a little caveat in here. This is very hard. So you don't want to do this. If you can preserve it, that's great. But sometimes you can come in and say, wait a second. The model they set up here was, let's say, for the start state model but now I need to keep things in sync down the road and it doesn't work. Now I'm gonna to have to refactor everything. Um, and so in that case, maybe you have to start fresh and say the context that I'm working in doesn't match the environment we're using. So we're gonna re rethink what happens. Now it is a difficult thing, but sometimes it's worth it because you'll save time in the long run by optimizing for your environment that you're in. All right, so that's tip one. Tip number two is about identifying indicators. You wanna figure out what are the most likely points of failure. So for this, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about, and maybe some of you have heard of these, um, but about canaries. So um, back in the day, mining was a very dangerous, dangerous task to do. The, one of the key reasons was carbon monoxide would leak out in these mines and miners would die. I recently, uh, came home after a conference, smelled gas in the house, uh, and, and it smelled like sulfur. But that's because they add it to carbon uh, to the gas now so that you can smell it. But poisonous gas that you don't even know is there, um, and suddenly it's like, oh, hey, my house is toxic now. In this case, it can happen. You don't know that it's there. It's odorless. It's uh, clear, so you can't see it, um, but it is super dangerous. So what they found was back in the day, they didn't, couldn't figure out a technology to be able to detect this. And what they found was they could use canaries. So canaries are small birds, um, but because they fly, because of what they're so active, they actually use twice as much oxygen uh, as a human does for their brain. So what that means is, as they're breathing down there, they're getting in more of that gas if it exists. So this method was allowed if they were down there working and one of the canaries fell off the perch, then they would know, hey, we gotta get out of here. There's a toxic gas. Now, thankfully, um, I, when I was reading this, I was alert, worried about how humane this was. Probably still not great for the birds, but thankfully, most of them actually would recover. They would pass out. They would get taken up. The first time this happened, uh, they later produced the bird at the inquest, so they were talking, and the bird was fine. Um, and so it, it helped save lives. But what happened here is there was a risk of this carbon monoxide, and they needed a way to identify it. So for them, it was this canary. Now, uh, as I said, thankfully it wasn't fatal. Um, they were used up till 1996 when finally they were able to replace them with actual carbon monoxide detectors um, and no longer need to use them. Um, one crazy last fact that I found, they were also used in World War I, and one captain kept uh, a record of all of his canaries, and one of them survived three different gas attempts. And so he then promoted it, um, and its only duty was then to sing to the officers um, for its wonderful distinction in the line of duty. So what does this mean for us? Um, we want to be looking for ways to identify risk. So we started talking about assessing that context that we needed. The next step is identifying risk. Where are you going to find single points of failure? Um, what platform or technologies are coming down the line uh, recently? And I was impressed at how many people were prepared and ready for this. End of life for Drupal 8 was critical. And we saw lots of people saying, hey, this is a risk. We need to make sure we get over to Drupal 9. Uh, thankfully, a lot of people did. So, um, you know, 
Keeping an eye out for that kind of technology shifts is critical as you're looking to say what risks are out there that I need to be ready for. Uh, the second piece is what are you going to use for your canaries here that I'm calling it? As you, as you think about um, identifying these things, if you're deploying at scale, it's really bad. Um, as I mentioned, we, I went to deploy in that first story, and all of a sudden, all 50 sites went down because they all got the problem that the first site had. Uh, and so how do you check for this? And so in this case, um, sometimes people call these canary sites, which is why I told that story. You might have a site that exists specifically to test your changes before they ever even get moved into any production environment because so many sites are impacted when you move that change up. So uh, if you can do it, it's great to have one site, uh, put some demo data in there or copy something from one of your production sites and test it before it ever rolls out. The second way to think about uh, a canary style site, an indicator for you of, of risk that may be coming, is what are your top X amount of sites to find that for you? What are the top pages for those sites? And make sure on every deployment, you immediately go and check those. So you maybe hopefully test this first on your canary site. And then now you go out and you test the actual live sites as it launches to make sure that all of them are getting the changes and they're up. Um, and so that way you're like, these are our most critical ones. If you've got a lot of sites, 50, 500, 200, whatever it is, it can sometimes not be feasible to check every site. So that's why identifying some key ones, um, especially look for ones that are complex, um, that have different unique things that you can identify and check first. And then um, if you're not identifying those risks, I'll just say that time will identify them for you. Eventually those things will fail and you'll have a new policy. That's how most of this, these tips that I have happened is I did something, it broke, and I was like, well, we need a new process to make sure that doesn't happen. But it's best if you can learn um, and avoid those to begin with. All right. Uh, the third tip that I want to share is to be boring. Now, this does, I know we want to have fun, we want to be excited, we want to be uh, you know, energized for what we're doing, but when it comes to DevOps, you want reliability. Save all of that creative energy for the front end of the site, for the functionality of the site that your users will encounter. There's a place for that. But for deployments, make them as simple and consistent as possible. What are the processes you can be sure people are going to follow? Um, so be thinking about what you can automate. The best way to make sure somebody doesn't make a mistake in their deployments is to automate that process away. Where can you make it so that they don't have an alternative? I had a developer, he loved um, developing, and he moved quick. He wasn't afraid to break things, which worked fine when he was working on one site. But when he came over and started working on um, the theme for a whole bunch of sites, when we had him working on 100 different sites, and he would make a change, and it wasn't quite properly quality tested before it went out, all of a sudden, all of those different people would experience that failure. So in the end, the automation piece was, well, hey, maybe developers shouldn't be able to deploy uh, out to our main branch anymore, and there's some kind of process that happens there. Um, and so rather than expecting people to always follow that process, if you can automate it, that's a much better way to go. Uh, you should also assume that things are just going to break. Um, often things will not go the way you want. So have a backup plan. Make sure that you have a plan, and you should also have backups, but I mean a fallback plan uh, to make sure that whenever you're working on the site, um, if something doesn't work, how are you going to revert a change if something happens and it breaks? Do you have a plan for that? And the third piece here is talking about, like, make sure you're testing them. The, the quintessential story is, like, having backups and the site fails, and then you find out, oops, our script wasn't running or the backups are corrupted. But it can happen the same way if you need to revert something. How do you make sure you know what to do? Um, uh, I was out to have a, a version of like AAA for if something happens to my car, my, my engine quit, and I suddenly realized I had never tested the process before. What was the phone number I was supposed to call? Because I had this uh, policy, I thought I was fine, but I had never tested it. So I had to spend 30 minutes trying to figure out how it worked before I could even get the help that I needed. So make sure you're testing things um, so that you know those fallbacks can be relied upon. All right. Um, another story. Sorry, this is like story time hour. Uh, so I was out with my friends in college, and we decided we were going to take a vacation out into the Ozarks. Beautiful area um, in the Midwest, but um, 
this was back before people had GPS on their phones, things like that, and we very quickly got out of any service reception. Uh, so we're driving out in these woods. It's beautiful, but all of a sudden, um, it's starting to get late at night, and we need to pull over to a, a hotel before we can go do our um, float trip the next day, or a motel, I should say. Um, and so we find this motel. It looks a little shoddy. I, it looks questionable. There's kind of an abandoned shack that's sitting out in front of it. Um, but it's the only thing around. We don't know how far the nearest one is, so we decide, let's go in here. They're open. We'll go use it. This isn't the actual picture. This is for inspiration. Uh, so we go in, we get our room, and then we get very hungry. And again, we don't know where food is. And so we're starting to say, I'm hungry. What are we going to do? We're in a place we don't know where we're at, and it's dark. And I look outside, and I see there's a strange man standing out there drinking a beer, and I'm hungry. So I'm like, well, I don't have GPS. I'll ask this person. So I go ask him. And he's like, oh, there's no food around here for like an hour. But I own that restaurant right over there. And I could make you some food if you'll come in with me. And I look. He's pointing to that abandoned building I was talking about. I'm like, what? And so I tell my friends, I'm going over. And they say, don't trust this guy. Don't go over. I'm like, I'm really hungry. I would rather risk it. So I go over, we go inside. It actually is a restaurant. It looks terrible, but there are seats and stuff. He takes me in the back. He starts pulling out a knife. I'm getting scared. But then he pulls out the sausage, and I'm like, okay, I'm your, I'm your friend. And I talk to him. 30 minutes later, he makes me this giant breakfast meal of sausage and eggs. It's wonderful. I come back to my friends, and we celebrate with this food. So why do I tell that story? Um, well, I tell it because... I want to tell you that people often get blinded to risk when there's something that they want. Now, I don't know. We, they also often ignore data. Who was right in this situation? My friends who said, that's too risky. Don't talk to the stranger and go into a strange building with him. Or was I right for trusting this person? It worked out for me. But I wanted food. I didn't care what the risk was. It was worth it to get some scrambled eggs. Now, the same thing will happen if you're managing a site is that people will get blinded by what they want. If you're working on a lot of different sites, you're going to start to get requests from people. Um, and this is where the idea of like governance can come in, but having some policies around how do you handle these things. Because at the end of the day, a bunch of the risks that we're talking about, these sites that we manage, it's a human factor that's there. It's a key aspect when you're assessing the risk that you're going to deal with. Because humans, when they want something... They don't care. I would get requests all the time. Well, I know we have a way to do a calendar already, but I really like this other option. Can we, can we ha have two of these? And it's like, no, well, here's our system. This is what we're going to do. We're going to stick with one. We need to make sure we're all using the same thing. And that creates extra overhead of needing to now manage two different solutions. So we can't have bespoke requests whenever we're managing 100 different sites because each one of those is extra overhead. And I'm sitting here. I love to do what people want. And I have to remember, though, even though I want that, I can't be blinded at the long-term challenge it will create if I suddenly start allowing all these individual options to show up. So um, it's just important to know this and be prepared. It helps if you've got policies in place so that you're not the bad person, like singly saying, we do this or we don't do that. If you're able to say, hey, here's the structure. It's this way for everyone. Which brings us to the next piece of that human factor is really around change management. Um, you want to be setting expectations for the people who are, who are receiving the code that you're deploying out. Whether that's the site editors or the website owners or even the, the, con the content or design, whoever manages these, it's important that they're, getting, they're hearing about what's happening, that they understand what's going on. If you're going to have a big migration, it may impact them in very different ways. Do they know that's going to happen? Are they prepared for it? Is there some training that you could maybe provide to make sure that they're ready for the new admin layout that might happen for them? So be thinking about how you can manage those expectations. And this brings us to the last piece here, here of the human factor, which is that in the end, it's about relationships. And as in our personal relationships with our friends, our spouses, our partners, um, 
communication is absolutely critical. Um, web ops, when we talk about it, web ops is people. That's what it is at the end of the day. It's all these different people that make your website work, make it happen. And so if you aren't communicating with them, if you aren't making them part of that process, they can feel isolated and then they might become, uh, start working against you. So bring them in, build relationships where you can with those people because you'll actually gain value. Um, there's ways to do that with having um, avenues for feedback. So sometimes um, we found some of our best ideas came from the people who were using the site. It wasn't all, hey, no to everything. That's terrible mindset to be in. But thinking about how, how does this improve this for everyone versus just one place, and you can get some really great feedback that way. So embrace that human factor. All right. Uh, and then tip number five um, is I want to encourage you to embrace transition. Your sites, all of them that you're working on, are never going to make it to this perfect state. And what would perfect even be? Is that a state of like zero risk? The only way to get to like zero risk is to not do it. There will always be some risk. So when you think about managing the risk for these sites, there isn't a state where it's all gone. But it's about finding an acceptable level. It's about making sure the largest uh, things are taken care of, the most likely things are happening. Um, and then just learning whenever something crazy happens um, that you don't know about. Um, it, it can be very tempting to try and, and make this happen, but you'll burn yourself out if you're only ever wor working towards that final state. Sometimes you just need to start and get going. Uh, part of this is because even if you could fashion uh, the perfect area that you wanted to get to, by the time you had all of that put together, there would be new technology. Drupal 11 will be out, and you're going to have to start worrying about what you're going to do with that. So it's always coming. So instead of viewing that as a, a bad thing, if you can embrace this and say, hey, we're ever growing, we're kind of that agile mindset, if, if you will, that we're always going to be growing, but we're, we've got forward momentum. That's what you're looking towards, you're improving, versus saying we've, we've made it, we've achieved this. When we started out, um, we had a goal of getting 10 sites onto the shared theme that we were going to use um, and bringing them into this like shared code um, area. And, and so we built for that. We were like, if we can get 10, this will be a successful project. And a year or two later, we hit 100 websites. And some people looked at that as a failure. They said, we failed. We made bad choices. We shouldn't have done that. What can we learn? What can we, like, we'll, we'll never do that again. But, but I think that was the wrong way to look at it. We did want to learn from that, but it wasn't really a failure. It succeeded. It did so well that we got 10 times as many people onto the environment. It just outgrew what we started with. So don't let, if we had started out and said, we're going to build that solution that's going to work for 100 different things, we couldn't have ever got funding. We couldn't have ever gotten the buy-in that we needed. And we weren't even skilled enough yet to actually know what best practice would be in that area. So we started out and started working towards it and adjusting as we went along. Um, and so if you, you've inherited a mess, maybe you've outgrown something, that's okay. Embrace it and just work on from that location. Figure out how you can just start, get in there, um, and, and begin using it. So um, don't let the, the perfection keep you from the good. Um, it's kind of a, this final tip here of embracing transition. All right, so let's bring this to our end here, the five things we talked about. Um, remember, why does this all matter? Because the impact of negative events is just so much larger as your sites scale up. Um, this necessitates that you begin to think about how you're going to manage this risk because you're going to impact so many people. And the solution is to use those steps of assessing the situation, identifying it, and minimizing that risk. Uh, to make sure um, they're less likely to happen rather than trying to avoid everything. Um, as I mentioned, the, the five areas we talked about, get that context on what you're going to be doing. Begin identifying your landscape where there's going to be problems uh, in the future. And then, again, embrace being boring. Um, watch out for that human factor. Use it to your advantage by cultivating relationships. And then just know that it's an ongoing process of, of continual improvement. Your, whatever you have is going to transition over time, and that's okay. All right, thank you all so much. I appreciate you coming out here. And then, um, if you've got any questions, I'm happy to take those. Yes, Taryn. How do you have so much energy? <laughs> 
Uh, it is the four bottles of tea I've drank today. <laughs> Can you repeat the question for the recording? Oh, yeah. The question was, how do I have so much energy? Um, and it is all the caffeine that I've consumed already. All right, any other questions? Yes. So the phrase, web ops is people, reminds me of Soylent Green. Was that intentional? <laughs> it was, yes. <laughs> yes, so the question was, um, the phrase, web ops is people, was that a reference to Soylent Green? Uh, and yes, that definitely came to my mind when I was thinking of it. So uh, uh, thanks for calling that out. <laughs> All right. Well, if we, let's see, any more questions? And how is that a reference to Soylent Green? Well, uh, spoilers, uh, if you haven't seen it, don't listen to this anymore on the recording. Uh, but in the, in the movie, there, there's a food source they have at the beginning, yeah, and they later right, find right. out it's yeah, generated, right. and they say, yeah, Solent yeah. Green is people. So that was just the language was, was the reference. Yeah, I mean, yeah. everybody knows that, right? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, there was a movie back in, like, the 60s. Right, yes, yeah. yes. We all watched that. Okay. Well, yeah, but lots of people who were born after that, maybe haven't seen it, so uh, it's, a, it's a good reference. <laughs> yes, it's definitely worth it. Thank you. No problem. All right, any, any final questions? All right, with that, I will wrap up. Um, you can find me on Twitter or most of the, uh, on uh, Drupal.org as Jay Rostaban in the Slacks. Uh, I'm John Richards the second. I guess there is an A, but I didn't, I, as I mentioned, I usually <laughs> skip that. Um, and then lastly, oh, well, I'll end this for the recording because you all aren't invited to the lightning talks. <laughs>